Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Conduit Club for this book night discussion with Andrei Kirchhoff, who has managed to, w managed to find his way to London a few days ago from Kiev. The event was planned some months ago, actually, with some prescience, it seems, sadly. And I, I must mention that next month's book club will be with Russia expert Fiona Hill, a coal miner's daughter from Durham who made her way to the White House by way of a Harvard scholarship to become advisor to presidents and others. It will prove complementary to this session, and in many ways I wish we had both Fiona and Andre on stage together right now. But first, Andre, thank you for joining us. Um, I must say I feel a greater weight than normal on my shoulders tonight, partly due to the situation in Ukraine, um, the size of this audience, and also um, I'm a big fan. I I'm so glad you're here. So what I aim to do with all these events um, after my nerves um, go away is to keep it informal and chatty and, and as if we're all sitting next to each other at, at a party, um, uh, on a train or a plane, getting to know you, uh, etc., and, and thus getting, allowing our audience to know you too. So we'll save our audience questions for the end, um, but if anyone has something urgent and pertinent to contribute before then, please raise your hand. <clears throat> First, please forgive me, but I, I must introduce you quickly for those very few in the audience who don't know you. Andrei Kirchhoff, who is Ukrainian, was born near Leningrad, writes in Russian, and has been described as an independent thinker, a post-Soviet Kavka, a Ukrainian Kurt Vonnegut and Haruki Murakami, a latter-day Bulgakov, a satirist, commentator, surrealist. Of the, many and fame, of the many and various feathers in his cap, Andre is the author of 19 novels, nine children's books, and 20 documentary fiction and TV movie scripts. His work is currently translated into 37 languages and published in 65 countries. His novels include the best-selling Death and the Penguin, <laughs> um, which we will discuss a little bit tonight, alongside Grey Bees and the Bickford Fuse, and alongside any other topics of conversation that may arise. Um, instead of me going on reading from the script, I thought it would be best, Andre, if you told us a bit about yourself and, and the evolution of your career as a novelist. And the, uh, uh, I understand that you learned Japanese at the Foreign Languages, Kiv Foreign Language Institute, as I learned Korean at the Defense Foreign Language Institute many years ago. And bef before I go on, before we started this session, I said to Andre, you know, I want to talk about your novels and your life as a writer and, and your books, and, and then we'll talk about politics later and the war. And he said, no, I want to start with the war and end with the war. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but first, would you tell me a little bit about your background and, and what, you know, how your evolution as, as a uh, novelist? Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, thank you for coming here. and. My problem is that when I start talking about myself, it can take half an hour or 45 minutes. I'm used to very long I'll time monologues. You. I'll time you. I'll time I need a, a very strict moderator and presenter who can I'll stop me. But <laughs> anyway, because I'm already 60 years old and I have a lot of things to say. <coughs> uh, I was born yeah, near Leningrad. My father was military test pilot. Uh, but uh, in 1962 or 63, uh, the Caribbean crisis happened, and my favorite Soviet politician of Ukrainian origin, Nikita Khrushchev, decided to show the world that the Soviet Union is a peaceful country, and he announced first unilateral disarmament. 100,000 officer, officers were dismissed from the army, demobilized, and my father was one of them. And that's how uh, the family moved to Ukraine, because my grandmother lived in Ukraine after the war. She was... Uh, a frontline surgeon during the war, and she ended the war as the head doctor, head surgeon of frontline hospital, train hospital. She was a tough uh, lady, uh, a Stalinist, uh, and uh, after the war she was the head doctor of the uh, sanatorium for kids with tuberculosis. So we, we moved to her house, and uh, we stayed there, we lived until we got a flat from Antonov plane factory. Probably you know the Antonov planes, which, uh, which uh, produced the biggest plane in the world, Maria, which was recently, three weeks ago, destroyed by Russian army. And uh, uh, I grew up, actually, in the uh, house filled with uh, books and atlases for surgeons, 
for medical books. That's why I have so many medical fantasies in, the, my, in my books, yeah. Uh, in, in fact, actually, the quality of medical books in the Soviet Union was much higher than the quality of children's books. I mean, the pictures were brighter. Uh, that's why, actually, uh, I mean, the, my, my sort of strongest impressions in childhood were cancer tumors and uh, bullet wounds <laughs> and this, the methods how to operate them, etc. Uh, but, uh, uh, well, I grew up in a, in a normal Soviet family, one can say. My father was uh, then p test pilot after he stopped being in the army. Uh, and he, he died only three years ago. He was 92. I'm very happy he didn't leave uh, to see the war uh, with Russia that we have now because he probably would die from heart attack. Uh, he was for a long time nostalgic about the Soviet Union, but I mean, in this age, people are nostalgic about their youth, and his youth was Soviet, and actually he was very happy to be a pilot. He was a proud pilot, and he was honest communist who refused uh, uh, career so that people wouldn't think that he is using his party membership to, to become a minister of aviation or something else. Anyway, I had lots of hobbies as a child. Uh, first hobby that influenced my life was uh, cacti. I, I, I started growing cacti at the age of seven or eight, and I was a member of Cacti Lovers Club in Kiev. <laughs> And at some point, I had collection number seven in Kiev, uh, in a small flat in Khrushchev's uh, house. The, some people probably know what is Khrushchev's house, five-story, small, similar flats, 45 square meters, together with the kitchen and everything else. Uh, <clears throat> and thanks to cactuses, I started uh, learning foreign languages, because I realized that every cactus has uh, just as any person, name, surname, and sometimes patronymic, and it is in Latin. So I started learning botanical Latin, and I knew the translations of the names of cacti. And then I learned Polish in order to read books which were not published in Russian or Ukrainian, but they were available in Polish translations. Then I started uh, studying English, and uh, the result uh, probably is very good, because I married a girl from Sari. And I, uh, in 1988, uh, and I refused to settle in Britain, and she agreed to move to the Soviet Union. And uh, we lived uh, there ever, happily, happily ever after until recently. But she is in Ukraine at the moment, and with our sons, and uh, they refused to leave the country. Uh, so uh, what else about my... I mean, I started writing poetry at the age of seven. I started... Um, inventing political and non-political jokes uh, under influence of my elder brother who was a dissident at the age of 13. And uh, I, mean, I, I mean, like just I went from poetry to jokes, from jokes to short prose, from short prose to novels, from novels to trilogies, but I wrote only one trilogy, thanks God, and nobody wants to publish it in English because it is 2,000 pages, but it is published in Italian and in uh, German. And, and, and publishers were biting their hands off to get your novel published, your first novel. You, they couldn't wait to publish your first novel. Are you sure? <laughs> it took, it took <laughs> in fact, actually, for 18 years, I was sending uh, my, uh, I, I was actually writing every day uh, novels, uh, short novels, short stories, and I uh, would spend every day two or three hours making synopsises of, in English, uh, then my CVs and uh, making copies of these letters and samples of the chapters in English. And I was uh, sending this also through uh, my Polish friend. I mean, he was smuggling out my manuscripts and sending them from Tarnów, from Poland, to the publishers worldwide. He would receive the rejections from all around the world to his address and smuggle rejections to me. <laughs> And uh, I think I have the biggest uh, uh, collection of uh, rejections in Ukraine, about 600. And it took me 18 years, actually. And what happened with, uh, with the Death and the Penguin when I wrote it in 1995, I also did, uh, it was already post-Soviet time, so I didn't need to s smuggle something. I could use post. We didn't have yet uh, faxes and uh, emails. And I... Uh, printed 40 copies of uh, CV, synopsis, and first two chapters in English and sent them 
to different American and English publishers. And uh, from England, I received my favorite rejection ever on this book, and it was very short. Dear Mr. Kurko, unfortunately, we are publishing only quality literature. <laughs> we, uh, we are wishing you good luck elsewhere. Uh, then I, I, I made 40 more copies of the same sort of package of information and sent to continental Europe. And then the Swiss publisher Diogenes wanted to read the original. I sent the original, and uh, three weeks later, I already installed fax machine at home, and I received a fax like uh, seven meters fax, which was a contract in two copies. And I read it, and I, I didn't know what to do, because, I mean, they were uh, offering me a huge sum, 5,000 uh, Swiss francs. Uh, and I suddenly got nervous, because I realized that if I sign it, does it mean that I should send any more uh, letters and packages of information about my books and what I will do with the time that will become free. <laughs> uh, but of course, I mean, I signed and uh, I went to meet the publisher who turned out to be a friend of uh, Federico Fellini and Friedrich Durenmatt. Uh, unfortunately, he is already uh, dead, uh, Daniel Kiel. Uh, but anyway, we met and he asked me to learn German so that I could present this book in German-speaking space uh, in German. And I learned German, and from 1999, uh, the book was published in 1999, I was presenting it in German. First two weeks, actually, I, I was reading extracts in German uh, without understanding what I read. Uh, but, uh, uh, and then I was trying to understand the questions, but very quickly, actually, I, I became fluent in German, and, uh, and now I do a lot of events in German, not, not now, but pre from... 1999, yeah, and uh, and actually what happened, the book was published in March 99, in June it became, uh, got into first top 10 books in Switzerland, then in Germany, and then the uh, Swiss publisher decided to buy world rights for this book, and the publishing house in London uh, that publishes only quality literature started buying uh, <laughs> rights, English language rights, uh, from a Swiss agent uh, for, for, for my books, including starting from this one, yeah. So I'm a happy man. Uh, I wanted to become a professional writer. I became a professional writer at the age of 37. I'm still a professional mm. writer, so I'm mostly uh, I'm fed by Penguin Misha, but uh -huh. some other characters also contribute to our family budget. So, I mean, it makes J.K. Rowling's um, rejection list seem, you know, paltry, really paltry by comparison. Um, you know, you talk about in that, that learning, uh, learning German, I think perhaps your language training at the, the Foreign Language Institute, perhaps. Well, you know. uh, there I actually I studied English and French mm -hmm. in the Foreign Languages mm -hmm. Institute and mm -hmm. uh, Japanese in this translator school. Okay. There's a, there's a line in, in Grey Bees where you talk about um, the main character goes to a funeral um, for a man who he doesn't know, um, uh, uh, one of the villagers, and he feels um, he can't understand anything. Uh, he can't understand the language per se, but he, he feels the language on his skin. And I thought that only a linguist could, you know, use a kind of, you know, a description like that of how the way, the way a language feels and the fact that you understood it without really understanding the words themselves. Mm? Um, so I want to um, talk about Misha, a little bit. Um, you talk about that's the, also the name of my brother. Um, okay. <laughs> so um, um, we're, we're here to talk about grey bees and other things, but I, I wanted to, um, my my father was a milkman. Uh, ha ha! I used to say that, but really he was. He came from a family of, with a long history of farming, and and worked in the dairy industry. And when I saw the review in the in the Financial Times in 2011 of Milkman in the Night, um, I had to read it, and it, it set the scene, if you will, for these next few books I read for tonight's event. Um, as reviewer and novelist Marina Lewica wrote, "You create a world where happy endings are unlikely, but sometimes, but still sometimes happen, no less in Tsarist or Soviet times than in present day Ukraine. And Milkman, like Death and the Penguin, is populated with animals who are as important to the plot as the human characters. So can you tell us a little bit more about the animals? 
Well, uh, I mean, I, 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 it's true, actually. In fact, I, I published 24 novels already, and there is only one novel, one or two, without animals. One, because uh, the main character is Ukrainian president, and then when you have a president, you don't need other animals in the book. <laughs> Uh, and the, the other one is actually uh, a matter of uh, life and death. Uh, it's a strange, actually, a short novel where humans behave like animals. Uh, but uh, generally, I think uh, why I have so many animals in the books, why? Because uh, as a child, I had some pets. I cannot say many because then I will feel guilty. But anyway, all my pets, uh, when I was a child, they died tragically and very often because of my neglect or because of other situations created by me. So, I mean, this is subconscious. Uh, re I, I repent subconsciously putting the animals in the books and giving them second chance <laughs> of life. Um, it's interesting that you talk about your, your, um, your great aunt, was it your grandmother? No, your grandmother, who was a surgeon. Grand grandmother, yeah. yeah. Great, great. And uh, uh, so many of the women um, in, in, in your, your, ca your characters are very strong women, and, and it's one of the kind of the solace that some of the male characters find in the strong arms of these women who help them for, perhaps, you know, lift the lift the, um, the, the, the beehives onto the back of the truck, and your main characters are surprised by their strength, and they feel, um, you know, great attachment to these women as well. Um, so as per your guidance um, to prepare for tonight's event, I read Death and the Penguin, then um, Grey Bees and The Bickford Fuse. I had already read Milkman in the Night. Um, but The Bickford Fuse I'm still contemplating, and, and I'm glad I read it in that order as I spoke to you about earlier, as I spoke to you earlier. Of the four novels I've read, Bickford, the Bickford Fuse is the most dreamlike or uh, nightmarish, depending on your, your point of view. Here's the Bickford Fuse. Um, it's the most allegorical and complicated. Um, it reflects, as it does, on the society you're commenting on. In your foreword, you note that it is about Soviet man, who is neither bad nor good, but simply Soviet. It explores his psychology, the nature of his thoughts, and his nation. The Bickford Views, described, as I'd say aptly by Sam Leith um, in the Financial Times, is a, is a sort of cross um, between The Pilgrim's Progress, Catch-22, one of my favorite novels of all time, um, Heart of Darkness, and The Road. And in The Bickford Views, we have a barge filled with dynamite, manned by two sailors, um, floating on an unknown lake, the endless taiga, is that how you say it? Ti taiga, taiga. An airship filled with warmth and which never needs to land. A searchlight um, perched on the back of a truck or a lorry, as you might say, that, that is out of petrol. It just continues to roll and roll um, and whose beam shines on nothingness. Um, so we have characters in this, in this novel who are lost and who are searching, but for what? but for what they don't really know. And as the title might indicate, and I found this resonated with, the, with your other books, this is a novel about light and dark, shadow and sun, of color and black and white, of silence and noise, of the memory of music, of a wooden bell that captures the wind and hums with a low reverberation as wind sounds through the trees, maybe, or as you might blow on the open top of a bottle to make it sound. I felt even a kind of thickness. The pace is slow, relentless, confusing at times and disorientating. This is your favorite novel, and I understand why but I would say it would have been a difficult one to start with, and though I highly recommend it. You have to be in the kind of headspace for it. And it's as if you've set the scene for this novel with the works that came before. Would you expand? Well, first of all, uh, I wrote this novel uh, from 1984 till 1989, still in the Soviet times. And uh, what happened that uh, in 1980, my uh, grandfather died, uh, who was Don Kozak, also a Stalinist, and he was ex-husband of my grandmother, Alexandra, who was a military surgeon. Both were very tough personalities. 
And only after he died, I found out that his two brothers actually were sent in 1937 to Gulag. And uh, uh, one actually survived 25 years uh, and then uh, settled in Irkutsk in Siberia. I don't know the destiny of the other. And uh, I realized that all the Soviet history that we were taught uh, was a complete lie. And I started looking for more information. And I, I was hitchhiking in the Soviet Union, river hiking, traveling, and I was looking for uh, so-called important pensioners. Because, I mean, there was a special title uh, in the Soviet times. If somebody occupied important position in the past and then retired, he would be called uh, like pensioner союзного значения, sort of the retired person of all union importance, of regional importance, etc. And I was looking for them and pretending that I'm a student of journalism and I was trying to interview them. And, uh, and actually, before that, I was a student at that time. And we had an American uh, professor who uh, gave me a, a great present, uh, a small uh, dictation machine uh, which uh, weighed only two kilos. Mm -hmm. And I was traveling with this and uh, with cassettes. And uh, I managed to find some uh, of the retired important personalities who were ready to talk. But then I realized actually only those who suffered after the death of Stalin, they, they were bitter and they, they could uh, tell me the real stories. Everybody who, uh, I would say, was retired, uh, retired in, a, in a good situation, they were silent when I was asking about 1930s, 50s, uh, uh, the fight uh, against uh, cosmopolitans, then anti-Semitism of Stalin, etc. They, they didn't want to, uh, to talk. And uh, once I found a, a real treasure, I, I, one can say, uh, I found an old man um, in Crimea, uh, near town of Sudak. Uh, this man, uh, he was a night keeper of the parking space uh, belonging to the sanatorium of police. And by accident, actually, he said that he was one of the uh, special prosecutors starting from 1935. And he was uh, dismissed from his job uh, in Khrushchev's time. And since then, actually, he had rubbish uh, positions. So his career, career was finished. And uh, I recorded about 12 hours of conversations with him. He was telling me how he was signing execution orders, etc. And, uh, and at the same time, sort of, he was mixing these memories with his personal life. And his personal life was incredible in the sense that uh, very early as uh, 18 years old, he decided that he will marry only a girl with the name Nadezhda, which means hope in Russian. And he found one girl he loved uh, with the name Nadezhda. He married her, uh, and then seven years later, she died of something. And uh, one year later, he found another Nadezhda and married her. And then... Uh, also something happened. So he had in his life three Nadezhdas. And uh, when I found him, he lived with a retired lady who was uh, a naval officer in the past. Uh, a huge lady, probably 70 years old, with a very specific sense of humor. And her name was Galina. So, so I mean, uh, and uh, I mean, I was so much... Uh, affected by, by, by these conversations with him, that I put him into the trilogy. His name was Alexander Petrovich Smurov. And for example, I, I still remember how he uh, told me that uh, uh, after 39, uh, after Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, when uh, Soviet Union seized uh, part of uh, Romania, uh, but first actually part of uh, Poland was taken. Uh, and uh, then a, a gypsy girl was arrested uh, crossing from Romania into Ukraine, and, uh, and he told me that he signed uh, an execution order for her because she was obviously a spy, but she was so beautiful and so young, so he, he felt sort of sorry for her life, but still, I mean, she was shot dead. And things, I mean, he was using these uh, quite uh, horrible words, 
uh, not with a smile, but somehow uh, mundane, in a mundane way, sort of something ordinary. And then, uh, I mean, I, I found some other people. Uh, so, I mean, I, I was trying to understand the atmosphere of life at that time. And of course, these people were young, so they were enthusiastic. They were enthusiastic when they were actually signing uh, the uh, sentences, sentencing people, etc. So they were sure that they are building a new society and that they are building something huge and they couldn't even imagine what will be uh, on this building site in the end. And uh, uh, the Bigford Fuse, I mean, I should tell you that actually the first time when I came here in 1988, I went to the uh, London Library uh, to patent department because I needed information on William Bigford, who is not known here except for Cornwall, where he lived. Mm -hmm. And he was a British engineer who invented fuse wire. And that's why fuse wire in Russian is called Bigford's wire. And uh, I just imagined his life and his dreams and his uh, nightmares and made him also a character in this book. So there are two real characters, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, whom I, I would say I love not in a sincere way, but uh, I, I, I feel some kind of sympathy and sorry at the same time for him. And William Bigford. Of course, I mean, there was another William Bigford who was British uh, playwright and who is probably more known. Mm -hmm. But uh, for me, a person, I mean, the, the mining engineer, uh, uh, William Bigford, was very important. Mm -hmm. And so it is British Soviet novel, and I always uh, just briefly explain that this is the history of evolution of Soviet mentality. And uh, I thought, actually, I was writing about history, but in fact, from this book, you can understand the mentality which exists now in Russia, because, I mean, it's the same way. The cult of war, the cult of victory, which was supported uh, by the Soviet system until 19, 1991 and was resurrected by Putin in 1999. And what is happening now is connected with this cult of uh, victory. Uh, Russia cannot lose any war. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think the war we have now, I mean, it will not be over in one month or two months, and it can be over quickly only if the person who started it dies mm -hmm. of natural order mm -hmm. or unnatural causes. <laughs> well, the, the main character in this book, Kortetsky, is that one of the main characters, Kortetsky? He, He's it's, the one, it's one of the uh, characters, several, yeah. He, there are he several. Leaves, he leaves the boat. Yeah, the main character is pa Pavel Dobrynin. The bit that with the Bigfoot, yeah. part of the Bigfoot feud over his shoulder, and he, because he's sort of been abandoned by the captain, yeah. and he, he the, the, the fuse that he leaves behind as he un, un, unreal, unspools is a sort of breadcrumb behind him, and he goes off on this journey for miles and miles. Well, and he miles. goes from Japanese Sea to, to Leningrad, and it mm. takes him uh, uh, 17 Six years. Times. And he is trying to understand uh, whether the war is over or not. And he cannot understand it. So he thinks that if he sees the enemy, he will uh, light the fuse and uh, the dynamite behind uh, will blow up and will not be used by the enemy. But then his idea changes and he thinks that if he doesn't like what he sees, he will blow up the whole world. Mm -hmm. Course, and nobody nobody knows if the war is still on or if it's off. And I mean, I think this is this also suffuses um, um, death um, gray bees as well, because in gray bees, your main character is living in this this gray zone um, between. And it, it reminded me, um, oh sorry, about of, of Philippe Claudel's. Um, uh, gray souls, where the wars is constant, constant kind of menace in the background. Um, let me just just go to my to my notes. Um, of the of the novels that I read, I think Grey Bees really affected me the most, and and it it um, is it, sort of suffused with this, um, as I said, this, this relentless. Um, a quest to, to stay alive and to endure, and, and also the joy in the mundane as well, or the kind of taking pleasure in the mundane. Um, and, I, and I think, um, let me just see here, let me just t talk to my note. So, um, forgive me for a moment. Um, 
pause, 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 pause. Okay. Grey bees, um, which reminded me a bit of Philippe Claudel's Grey Souls, both set at a town, in a town at the edge of the war zone, the reverberations of the war, you know, at, um, um, suffuse the story with tension and sadness. And, and like Bickford Views, we have here again the silence. And, and as you write, the sound of the distant bombardment is integral to the silence. And in this book, to me, is about a people who have grown accustomed to fear as much as they are able to grow accustomed to fear. And fear, as you write, is an invisible thing. It is about becoming used to the slow passing of time, of about those who live but separately, contained, but with brief moments of affection and tenderness, its rarity the norm rather than the exception. You write that um, people, you know, die, people who die of fear die like most others who spend their lives that way, of a heart attack. And, and here also, I believe you remind me of, of Japanese writers or perhaps Norwegian writers. You know, you write so poetically about the mundane, as you were talking about earlier, about the simple act of existing, of enduring, um, as you do with Death and the Penguin, endurance is a constant theme of the will to live, of the pleasures taken from the most basic things, a good meal, a beeswax candle, a tank full of petrol, the arms of a strong woman. But also, in Grey Bees, you, you use the bees allegorically. It is a reflection on existentialism. I love this novel so much, include, uh, and, and I want you to tell us a little bit more about Grey Bees, its inspiration, and, and, and what you write about in the foreword, of course. Well, first of all, I didn't plan to write this book, and actually when I was asked whether I'm writing already about the war, I uh, usually said I'm not going to write probably uh, not only until the war is over, but uh, until 10 years after the war passed, and we can actually talk about this like about something that is in distant past. Uh, but uh, what happened that uh, from 2014, we had suddenly in Kyiv lots of cars with Donbass number plates. And then that these were the rich people and middle class people who moved uh, to Kyiv uh, at once after the beginning of the war. And then the poor people from Donbass came in their ladders or without cars. And uh, suddenly you, you go to see friends and uh, there are people, resettlers or refugees, who are also friends of friends and you talk to them. And one of uh, resettlers or refugees who moved to Kyiv and opened a small cafe, he told me that uh, he's driving every month to the front line and there is a village abandoned by almost everybody except seven families. And they don't have electricity, gas, they don't have shops, post, police, nothing. Uh, and of course, and he's bringing them uh, medicines and whatever they ask for, and they are thanking him with uh, pickles and with things they make from vegetables. And he is selling this in his cafe, and very often they are bought by other refugees. And that's how actually I started thinking about uh, gray zone. I realized that the gray zone always has the same lens as frontline. And frontline in Donbass until recently was 430 kilometers. And this gray zone is actually the space between positions of Ukrainian army in Ukrainian case and the positions of separatists and Russian volunteers in Russian army. And in some places this uh, path or this strip of land is uh, 80 meters or 100 meters and in some cases it's three kilometers or it can take the whole district of a, of a town like Avdeevka is industrial town and part of it is in inside gray zone from 2014. So actually I started uh, researching a bit. I, I went not because of the book but I went uh, for other reasons three times to the uh, front line zone and I traveled once uh, the whole front line uh, along to the Russian border, to Severodonetsk. And I talked to many people uh, who uh, fled uh, from Donbass. I talked to people who stayed on. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we had already about 200 books about the war in Donbass, but all these books were about soldiers. So Ukrainian hero soldiers and uh, traitors and separatists. So there were no human lives and human stories told in this uh, books, and I, I, I thought that this is not correct. I mean, we should give voice to those who decided to stay, because, I mean, people in Donbass, uh, they, are, they are different, yes. I mean, they, they were under control of local mafia, local oligarchs, and uh, 
they were influenced by, by uh, Russia. I mean, Russia was financing and supporting Soviet nostalgia there. I mean, the most popular TV channel there was called, I mean, it is called Nostalgia, and it is broadcasting black and white Soviet television programs very often, black and white and, and color Soviet films. Uh, a lot of actually films about the Second World War. And uh, of course, uh, this is an industrial zone, so you have a lot of proletariat and not so many intellectuals. And after 2014, this territory remained without any kind of elite. So, I mean, cultural, political, business elite either left for Russia or left for Ukraine. And so the territories were ruled by criminals, and some of the criminals now became local politicians sponsored by Russians, and uh, actually some uh, uh, Ru Russian uh, specialists were sent on business trips there uh, to organize life, because locals were not capable, those who remained. So uh, for me, I mean, people in, in Donbass were always hardworking, uh, stubborn, and uh, they traveled the least in Ukraine. Uh, it was quite tr traditional for people in Donbass not to travel outside their small district or their region. Uh, another thing is that we had always uh, two cliches created by Ukrainian politicians, one negative cliche about people of Donbass and one negative cliche about people of Galicia of Western Ukraine. So according to these cliches, all the people from Donbass were bandits and thugs, and uh, all the people in Western Ukraine were uh, radical nationalists who were prepared to kill any Jew or any Russian speaker. I mean, both are lies, but I mean, Ukrainian politics uh, uh, is not something easy to explain uh, because, I mean, probably I should go very deep in the history, not very deep, but uh, I mean, uh, first I want to say that the Russian mentality is very different from Ukrainian mentality. Uh, Ukrainian history is different from Russian history, and the war is also about the history because uh, Ukraine doesn't accept uh, Ukraine, Russian version of Ukrainian history. Uh, Ukraine never had a royal family, never had aristocracy, uh, never had a Tsar, uh, except when it was practically taken over by Russia. In 15th, 16th, 17th centuries, uh, Ukraine was independent territory ruled by Cossacks with, without fixed borders because all the borders were front lines with Russians, with Crimean Tatars, with Tatars, with the uh, Poles. And uh, at the same time, uh, Cossacks were uh, running elections to elect their leader, who was called Getman, who was the head of the army and head of the territory. They were electing uh, higher officers. They had diplomatic service, and in Istanbul archive you can find correspondence between Turkish Sultan and uh, Ukrainian Getmans. There was uh, a legal system, there were military courts. Uh, they were also corrupt, like today's Ukrainian courts. And uh, Hetman Mazepa actually used uh, uh, one of the courts to get rid of his uh, ex-friend who refused to, to allow uh, his daughter to marry Mazepa. So, I mean, in the history, you can find lots of things. They are similar to what was happening recently in Ukraine. And uh, Ukrainians, as the result, they are individualists. They are used to live in organized anarchy. Everyone has his own opinion. Nobody respects the uh, Getman or the power or the rules. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, I mean, they, they never loved any kind of uh, leader. Uh, so the, the result, uh, we have the highest number of political parties registered in Ministry of Justice in Ukraine, 400 plus. <laughs> Which means that every Ukrainian who wants to be politically active, he looks around, he understands that he doesn't like any of the political parties that exist. He wants to be leader of the political party. <laughs> so he registers his own political party. And then actually, uh, when it, he doesn't have money to promote it, uh, he doesn't know what to do with it. He keeps it sort of frozen, and then sometimes he sells his party. And a small party is very cheap to buy, twenty, thirty thousand dollars You Because, I mean, if you want to take part in local elections, you want to register your party, you cannot uh, take part in the elections one year after the registration. But if you buy a party, you can go straight to the elections. So uh, the, the system works like this. So, I mean, 
I want to buy a party and you have a party, I come to you and say, you don't use your party, can I buy your party? And you say, okay, let's do this. So let's have a general meeting of the party and uh, we have, we will re-elect the leader, I will become the leader of the party, the name is the same, but I can change the name as the leader. And now I can revive this party and go with this party or on behalf of this party uh, to become uh, a local deputy, for example. I mean, I don't think it is relevant now, mm. this, but I mean, but this is a completely different system than the uh, system created by Russian mentality, which was also Soviet mentality, which is collective, which is based on the matrix of monarchy, where everyone loves the Tsar, and if people are fed up with the Tsar, they kill him and love the next one. <laughs> and uh, uh, you can see from the history, I mean, before 1917, uh, all Tsars remained Tsars until they were dead, killed or of natural causes. And then in the Soviet Union, the general secretaries all were re-elected until they were dead, uh, except for Nikita Khrushchev. And then now uh, we had a brief uh, change uh, after 1991 with Gorbachev and Yeltsin. From 1999, it's one party system one Tsar who is re-elected and will be re-elected again until he is dead. And uh, people are happy to have this Tsar and they are proud that the world is afraid of them and the world doesn't know whether Russia will launch nuclear weapon use or not. So, I mean, these two mentalities, I mean, of course, it's very difficult for them to coincide. And 20 years ago, the border between two mentalities actually was cut in Ukraine in two halves because... Uh, Practically, the policy of Russification, of removing Ukrainian language and introducing Russian language as the main language of Ukraine, uh, it was used also to promote Russian mentality. Lenin's dream was to create the society, the country, with no ethnic roots. He said that we will, know, will not have Ukrainians or Uzbeks, we'll have only Soviet people, which meant that Soviet people can have only Soviet history behind. No traditions except the ideological, cultural elements of Soviet life. And uh, a little bit like Xi Jinping is doing for China now as well. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the, the, well, I mean, the same is done by Putin because, for example, there are there were problems in Kazan and Tatarstan where uh, suddenly. Uh, Moscow decided that there is too much Tatar language in Tatarstan, and if if they speak Tatar. Uh, it will definitely lead to separatism. Mm -hmm. And actually, in uh, Russian rhetoric, the Ukrainian nationalists are those who speak Ukrainian. If they speak Russian, they are okay. They are normal Ukrainians. But if they speak their mother tongue, they are nationalists. I mean, I must say, like, with all, you know, every novelist you know, is, is, is every novelist like you, I think it, it's political. What you're writing about is political, and it becomes more and more politicized as the situation, you know, changes. And, I mean, I, I, it's been sort of surreal reading these books as the war has unfolded and reading the newspapers and, and, and listening to the radio and, and watching the news and, and yet reading this alongside. And um, it, it's as if I, my, you know, my education has um, you know, expanded, uh, um, you know, to, do, to agree. I, I never expected it to. But I think with all, with all um, novels like... Um, I remember reading about Myanmar, uh, you know, reading, uh, trying to, to do a lot of research, reading a lot of nonfiction about it. And then I read The Glass Palace by Amitav Ghosh, and then it all came together. And, and, and it just came alive, and, and it made me understand, you know, the nuances of it. And what, what you're not getting here, I suppose you might have got it a little bit um, from Andre's, you know, talk, is that the novels are funny, they're absurd and they, they catch you off guard because you know they're full of black humor and you find yourself laughing at the most uh, you know horrific things. There's a part in um, is it the Bigfoot Views where they're in the boat and there's a group of German. I'm going to give this away because very early on the group of Germans who are like surrendering, surrendering, and and the captain of the boat goes ah boom and he kills them and he's just like ah yeah well you know it's, it's easier and he just sort of it's a, a discard like this chap that you met in the car park right you know. He, it just kind of the, it, he makes it so, so oddly, you know, sort of common, a, a kind of common thing that almost happened as if it were, you know, killing a fly. But the way you write it is just so kind of funny. You, you find yourself laughing. You think, oh my God, he just murdered a boat full of people who are trying to surrender. It's not funny. 
Um, but um, so I, uh, uh, before we move on to, to, to more politics, because we will, um, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you about um, two things in Gravies, uh, lots and lots of things about Gravies, but um, one, Petro. Um, gosh, this is sort of, it, makes, it made me feel sort of, it's poignant. There's a soldier, Petro. So um, the main character in the book has, you know, they have very little electricity, and he has this mobile phone that he charges up when he can, and he's made friends with a soldier from the Russian Ukrainian, Ukrainian, Ukrainian side. From the Ukrainian side, yeah. And he gives the soldier a meal and some vodka, honey vodka. And no, no, the soldier refuses. Refuses. To, uh, yeah, okay. yeah, because actually the soldiers refuse to take stuff duty. from locals because they think they, they can be poisoned. So they, they make this connection. And then throughout the rest of the book, they just, um, they, they just send, he just sends out this one text saying, alive. And then Petro writes back, alive. It's kind of moving, and then for a while he doesn't he doesn't hear from Petro, and he thinks, well, he must be dead, or something. And then eventually, at the end, we find out what happens to him. I won't give it away, um, and it's a really moving kind of thread that you know kind of is that pulls you through this book. The kind of the will to live. Um, yeah, I mean, the main character, from my fate. point of view, a typical represent uh, uh, representer of uh, Donbass people. I mean, he is hardworking, he worked in the mines. Uh, he's young, retire well, I mean, like young retiree because of the uh, professional illness. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's a big keeper. He was left by his uh, wife and daughter who didn't want to live in this village and he didn't want to move to a bigger city. He lives with six beehives with his bees. And in this war, in the beginning, he defends only his bees. So they, they are kept in the winter in the barn, and they are surrounded by the pieces of metal in case shrapnel comes, yeah. And, uh, and he sort of observes the nature, and for him, actually, nature is the main university. And he loves the bees because he thinks that the bees are the only uh, beings that manage to create communist society. Uh, he also thinks that actually the only beings that created socialist society are ants, and people are hopeless. I mean, this is all mixture of sort of post-Soviet thoughts and feelings and uh, understanding of life, yeah. And he dreams in the beginning of the novel that uh, in the springtime, if the war is still going on, he will take his bees on holiday. He, will, uh, he has uh, his ladder also, well hidden from anybody, and uh, a trailer, and he will take them outside uh, the war zone to Ukraine proper, controlled by the government, and find a place so that they could uh, fly and collect pollen, and the, the, the honey will be sweet, because when he offered some honey to Petro, to the soldier, Petro said that the honey is bitter. And, and then Sergei, the main character, decided, well, that's why, that's because the fields where the bees are collecting pollen are filled with gunpowder, with burned gunpowder from the mines and from the bombs. So he, he's dreaming about this journey, uh, the first part of the novel. And the second and third parts of the novel, this is already a road movie where he is traveling with bees and he is trying to find place for himself and for the bees. And in fact, actually, he is behaving also like a bee. He belongs to these beehives, but he's too big. But in his dreams, actually, he sees uh, bees of human size. And then when he comes to uh, Crimea and next Crimea, because he uh, once met a Crimean Tatar beekeeper during the beekeepers conference 20 years ago, he decides to go there. And the Russians uh, accept him as a victim of Ukrainian nationalists. And he silently agrees that he is a victim, yeah. And then he is uh, engaged in Crimean Tatar life, which is very difficult there. And they, 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 this, the, his old friend is missing and his wife is asking him to go to FSB and to check on his destiny because they will tell you, you are Russian speaker, you are from Donbass, they, 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 they trust you. So he's doing this and uh, he, after actually he starts looking for him, he, the body of this man is found. 
and uh, I won't, yes. But anyway, he, he learns a lot about uh, Crimean Tatar Muslim culture, etc. And then uh, somehow, I will not give away, the beans get mixed up with the Russian Secret Service. <laughs> with very unpredictable uh, consequences. And, and is, is there really such thing as a, a bee bed? Yes, yes, and you can, I cannot tell you, come now to Ukraine and test it, but uh, uh, you can find it anywhere in Ukraine, actually. People are lying, I mean, there are special, like, beds. Uh, you sleep on the beehives, and uh, you, uh, I mean, it, it's supposed to, to be good for nervous system and for coming down uh, your state, I mean, because uh, the vibration of bees uh, is passed to your Healing. body, and then it, so, somehow it's considered healthy and it's very popular. Yeah, I've read about that, the cats, the way they purr, that if, they, if you can get the body, you know, in that kind of vibration. Um, so, uh, uh, how much time do we have? Are we here for another half hour? Just a, I can't remember what's going on. We're getting close to, to question time. Okay, but, yeah. Uh, Just let me... Um, before we do that, I mean, um, we'll, we'll go to, towards politics a bit and then we'll go to question time. There's a line in, in Grey Bees where you say, or, the, or, the, or the, 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 the character says, what happened is what Putin, or Putin says happened. Putin doesn't lie. And when did you write this? I mean, when did you write, when was this written? I think it was... Well, uh, this is in Grey Bees. Oh, it was in Grey Bees. Oh, Grey Bees, yeah. sorry, Grey Bees. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, these books and, are... And so this is actually the words said in the novel by a Russian speaker lady from Crimea mm -hmm. who lives in the same village with Crimean Tatars. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, when I spoke to Andre before this, he wanted to talk about... Um, he, I don't know if you've seen his article in The Guardian. Was it today that it was published? Yeah. And, and um, so, uh, Andre, you wanted to talk about the culture war as well, uh, and, and what, is, what is Ukrainian post-Soviet literature, and, and how has it changed post-Maidan, and, and what now? And, 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 and what you said, what should writers do in wartime? And I want to expand on that and talk a little well, bit about Well, first of all, uh, Ukrainian literature after the Soviet Union went a completely different way, but there was a pause of seven years in which we didn't have new literature at all, uh, because, I mean, the potential writers were still not ready to write, and the Soviet time writers were not read anymore. And in this time, actually, the book market, which at that time is, still existed, we don't have it now, uh, was filled with, uh, first of all, with translations of crime stories into Russian from all the languages of the world. Then science fiction came. And then 1997, we suddenly uh, got a generation of uh, mostly young female writers and one uh, young man writer who were writing for several years books about sex, drugs, and rock and roll because we didn't have this literature in the Soviet time. And suddenly, in 2004, uh, during the Orange Revolution, this literature was gone, was not interesting anymore, and there were some novels about history, historical events in Ukraine, because history for Ukraine is very important, since in the Soviet time, the real Ukrainian history was not taught, was not published, and was not known. I'm not talking only about deportations of Ukrainians who didn't want to collect to join collective farms to Siberia. I'm not talking about the artificial famine, but lots of other things were not mentioned. And, and the Ukrainian historians, uh, some of them were trying to write real history. Some of them, as always, uh, were trying to create patriotic history, adding myths to real events, etc. So, I mean, we, we don't have now a fixed history book that can be 100% true. But at least uh, Ukrainians know much more about the history. And writers, of course, they were contributing uh, to histo by historical novels to both, to the truth and to the myths. And from 2013-14, the literature changed completely. It became very politically engaged, uh, very militant. And uh, what happened then, uh, after two or three years of the war, suddenly we got, instead of one literature, two literatures. Because the 
war veterans, Donbass war veterans, started writing books themselves. And they were writing memoirs, uh, diaries, uh, novels, short stories. And uh, today we have 400,000 war veterans. And they are very active readers, but they read only books written by other war veterans. And what was interesting recently before the war, that there was a quite an open and loud conflict on Facebook between traditional writers and war veterans. And I mean, some of the war veterans became best-selling authors, but the traditional writers were saying that they are lying. They, 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 this guy couldn't sell over uh, internet 35,000 copies of his book about the war. In, in fact, he did. His name is Valery Marcus, and he was the first best-selling author from, from this generation. But we have already uh, this war veterans writing not only about the war, but about everything else. So uh, at the moment, actually, they are still separate uh, groups of writers, but I think in the end they will, uh, will be reunited uh, and it, they will turn into one society. But today we have writers who are fighting as soldiers on the front lines. We have writers who are in occupation. I am in touch every day with a lady writer who is in Melitopol, in occupied Melitopol, and she's in hiding uh, because uh, actually FSB agents are walking the streets with lists of names and addresses and actually taking people for interrogation, kidnapping people. Uh, uh, and uh, of course we have some uh, writers uh, as refugees abroad and majority of Ukrainian writers are now in Western Ukraine just like everybody else. So, I mean, half of Ukraine moved to the West, but only three and a half million of people crossed into Europe. The others are on the border or in Galicia, near Lemberg, or in Ivano-Frankivsk. They are waiting to see what happens and hoping, they hope that they will be able to go back. In fact, actually, some of the towns are freed already from Russians, but the government says the people shouldn't go back because it is dangerous and it's not clear, actually, how the events will uh, develop further. So you're the president of PEN in Ukraine, and you're traveling around a bit uh, this, this next eight days, partly as for PEN, I, I, would, I would guess. Uh, not exactly, actually. Uh, I'm, I, I'm doing fundraising okay. uh, for refugees, but also, I mean, we are collecting money for Ukrainian writers, mm. uh, and we are helping them, actually, with the, with the money that we receive. We, we have a, uh, the Belarusian, actually, PEN members set up an account in Poland for Ukrainian PEN, which we can use. And, uh, and I mean, it's good that, I mean, we have solidarity, not only of PEN centers, but of ordinary Poles, Lithuanians, and people who want to help refugees, but also writers. Yeah. So what, what should writers do in wartime? Well, I mean, I think that nobody is writing fiction now. I mean, I stopped writing fiction weeks before, uh, before the beginning of the war. I write articles and texts, and I probably will publish a collection of these texts about the months before the war and the war itself, uh, maybe in the autumn, and I hope that by the autumn the war will be in the past and there will be a huge task of rebuilding, destroying uh, cities and towns and villages, but uh, you cannot predict anything now. But uh, I think many Ukrainian writers became sort of diplomats. I mean, they, they are participated mostly in online discussions, and we are running uh, in English online discussions. We had recently, and you can find it on Facebook, on uh, Penn Center Ukraine, uh, page, for example, a dialogue with Margaret Atwood, Natalka Snedanka, Ukrainian writer from Lviv, with Margaret Atwood. We started this uh, series uh, with my dialogue with Philip Sens, uh, and it was a very interesting conversation, and it is recorded, and it is also on YouTube. So we, we are trying, actually, to publicize and to, to, to make the situation in Ukraine known in the world, and I think, actually, in Europe, uh, Ukrainian writers managed to publish a lot of articles. I mean, we have a young writer, uh, Markian Kamish, who is a specialist. It's interesting maybe because his first book uh, is published now, I think, in English. Uh, it's about illegal tourism in, in Chernobyl zone because he was illegal tourist himself for 20 years in Chernobyl zone. And now, I mean, he's very well known in Italy. So he is publishing articles about events in Ukraine 
uh, every two days in Italian newspapers, yeah. And uh, other writers, are, uh, if they are more famous in Poland, they are published, working for Polish media. Uh, so th this is now the task of the writers. I mean, in all these books, there's a there's a foreword, and there's there are also very there are very few a very few um, footnotes or endnotes that you can refer to. So again, you know, you you learn about you know what's going on in Ukraine, and the, the, the forewords written you know several years ago are so prescient. You just as, as if you predicted what was going to happen. Now, I suppose many people you know understood what would happen and just weren't you know didn't have the privilege of of writing about it and. and um, so look, I, I want to. We're about that time where we're going to open up to the audience. I'm sure you all want to um, engage with Andre, and please, 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 don't be shy. Okay, you're, you're the first chap with the brown jumper. Uh, thanks very much. If I could be greedy and get away with two questions. Um, firstly, I'm, I'm very intrigued by your mention of your trilogy, your 2,000-word tome, which has, which English language publishers have so far avoided um, contact with. Um, for those of us who either speak Russian or I think you said tr it's been translated into it's German. In Italian and German, German, yes. Yeah. Um, I'd just be very grateful if you could give us a few more, a bit, first of all, its title, and a, a, so a, a bit more of a description of, of what it's about. And the other question, if I could, is uh, um, just, I'd be interested in your own thoughts and reflections on what the changes in the book market, publishing, uh, publishing in Ukraine, uh, um, whether in Russian and Ukraine, have actually done to the landscape of bookshops in Ukraine over recent years. My, I've certainly noticed that in my trips to Kiev since 2014, more and more bookshops have started just disappearing. There, was, there was, used to be a whole series of them in, in the tunnels under the Maidan. Uh, there used to be a huge sort of three-story bookshop somewhere else, just near the university on Levatostov or somewhere like that, I think, which I, on my last trip I realized had disappeared. Um, and similar pattern in Odessa. And I'd just be interested to hear your own reflections on that. Well, the, the trilogy is called uh, Geography of a Single Gunshot. It's also a history of... Uh, Soviet mentality, but it is more like adventurous novel with about a hundred of characters and four plot lines, and one of the characters is a parrot, Kuzma, uh, who uh, writes poetry. Uh, and uh, actually he uh, reads poetry, and his own thinks that actually that he was taught poetry by some unknown gen genius uh, uh, poet. It's a long story, but I mean, another c character is the the angel from heaven who was so curious uh, to find out why people, uh, why Soviet people after death don't come to heaven. So he goes down to the Soviet Union hoping to find a, a real good person and to accompany him until he is dead and taken to the, to the heaven. And uh, uh, once he is in the Soviet Union, uh, it is like 1921, uh, uh, a Red Army soldier is trying to kill him, so the angel stops the bullet with his hand and says that, uh, well, if you are already uh, flying the bullet, if you are already on the route, so go around and find the hero, and when you find the hero, you will stop and you will kill nobody else. So the bullet becomes a character in this novel and becomes an artificial Sputnik of the Soviet Union. And it is trying, actually, the bullet to stop flying. The, the bullet is looking for a hero, hoping to, to stay in the hero. But every person the bullet kills is not a hero. So it goes through and flies further. So I mean, th th this is kind of novel. <laughs> and the, about bookshops, uh, well, I mean, the, as I said, uh, I mean, we don't have a book market now. The main buyer of the books is the government, uh, which buys books for the libraries, or used to buy, not now, it's not the time to buy books. But what happened that from the very beginning, uh, the bookshops were created in order to be sold to investors as working businesses which meant that actually the first organizers of bookshop chains were crooks. And uh, they managed, I mean, the, the three-story 
uh, bookshop uh, which was called Bukwa. It was a, one of the uh, bookshop chain uh, bookshops created by uh, one lady who previously was selling wholesale vodka. And now she lives in Serbia. But she actually managed to uh, take uh, on uh, like uh, hundreds of thousands of books from all possible publishers on sale or return basis. And with these books, she sold the bookshops which were uh, rented, I mean the premises were rented, to Polish uh, MPIC uh, bookshop chain. And the Poles were naive, I mean they bought nothing, they bought debts. And when they actually started understanding what was happening, they had to close down half of the shops. And in the end, actually, all the shops were practically closed. So, I mean, this is a typical story of, uh, of the beginning of uh, 2000. So we, we have enthusiasts and we have independent bookshops, but uh, for the country with 40 million people, I mean, uh, there are not more than 20 or 30 independent bookshops where the uh, bookshop owners are also selling the books personally and they are enthusiasts and they are helping actually some publishers to promote books which are worth, worth reading here. And of course now, uh, uh, what is happening now actually, I mean, my friend at this time, Mikola Kravchenko, a publisher from Kyiv, uh, is working, he's editing a manuscript of a young female uh, author from Lutsk who wrote a novel about domestic violence. Uh, he knows that actually the, there will be no publishing in the, in the next two years, but he still, it keeps him busy. Uh, but at the same time, the publishers who are publishing children's literature, uh, they were asked by Lithuanian print works and uh, by Polish print works to give them rights to publish these books in Ukrainian. And, uh, and, and they publish the books, print books, and distribute them for free among the families of Ukrainian refugees. So there is... Uh, another kind of circulation of the books, and some of the printers are even paying uh, some money to the publishers to to let them uh, live and help them financially. Uh, I was contacted by a Swedish e-publisher who also asked permission to publish my children's books as e-books also for refugees who are going to Sweden. So, uh, so the, the some of the Ukrainian books are following the refugees. One can say that actually the, the book industry is also a refugee now. Um, uh, can we have the... Uh, you go, go, you go. Thank you. Um, can I just ask a, a tricky question? Sorry, I'm hiding behind here. Um, the whole Putin narrative of the war is built on the idea of uh, genocide, they call it, in the Donbass. Obviously in the West there's a lot of understandable cheerleading for Ukraine. But I've, I've never really seen any Western reporting on what was going on in the Donbass before 2014 or since then. Can you tell me, I mean, the, the neo-Nazis do exist in Ukraine. There's a lot of dark stuff that happened there. What actually happened to Russian speakers in the Donbass before 2014? Was there oppression? Was, what happened? There were no repressions, but there were some, I mean, what, what happened when the war started? Uh, there were uh, battalions of different volunteers going because they, the Ukrainian army at that time didn't exist practically. So the volunteers went from different regions uh, to defend the uh, Ukrainian border. And uh, one uh, group of volunteers, for example, turned out to be ex-police people who were dismissed from police and some of them even were in prison previously. And this group actually was robbing the houses in Donbass. They were arrested later and some of them were imprisoned, some of them were on the run and went to Russia. Uh, I mean, there are, I don't know about other situations when actually the inhabitants of Donbass were uh, mistreated, but I mean, this group, for example, of the ex-police officers, and this was the group called Tornado, they were Russian speakers themselves. And actually today's uh, civil population that is suffering in Melitopol, uh, in Akhtyrka, in other places. I mean, east and south are Russian-speaking regions. Did I answer? So are you saying that there was no oppression? So before the war, before 2014, uh, you're saying there I was mean, no I, oppression? Kiev is a Russian-speaking city. 
Uh, I, I write and publish my books in Russian. I mean, I, I was not oppressed. I had lots of discussions, public and non-public, with nationalists. I was never beaten up or never was. Uh, I was actually uh, threatened by other Russian speakers, but not by Ukrainian speakers. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, I'm over here. The, uh, last weekend, I would started finding the news from Ukraine so upsetting that I stopped reading the news and decided to read Death and the Penguin instead. Um, I found Misha's, the character Misha Penguin, or Penguin Misha, and his relationship with Victor, something very moving and powerful about it, but I don't really know what. Can you explain what, where you the inspiration for Misha's personality, their relationship, and what he means to you and why you wrote about him? Well, uh, the book was written in 95, and uh, the post, first post-Soviet years were quite dark, because I remember that uh, uh, what we did with my wife when I earned first $100, we put a bulletproof door on our flat. And we had our friends killed who were trying to become small business people, etc. So, I mean, the, the Soviet system, uh, Soviet structure disappeared. And uh, instead of rules and laws, we, we had suddenly the society or the life ruled by criminals. And, uh, and this was very painful for people with collective mentality, with uh, sort of uh, habit to live in the, in the Soviet Union. And for me, uh, the best, uh, I mean, the, the animals the most close to the Soviets uh, are penguins, because they're always together. They do the same walks when they live in a community, uh, generation after generation. And if you actually, uh, and they have, the, they have a collective feeling of geography. I mean, they can uh, walk uh, in correct direction only when they are together. If you... Uh, separate one penguin from the group, this penguin will not know where to go. It loses the orientation. And that, in this sense, I mean, they are very similar to Soviet people who suddenly uh, found themselves without their country. So, I mean, they, they were fed, uh, they had a cage, and then the cage got open and nobody was bringing the food. Uh, so, for me, actually, uh, Misha the penguin and Victor, they are both uh, representatives of unnatural solitude. So, I mean, they, they are stuck together uh, and they are mostly interdependent. They didn't become friends, they are not family, but, I mean, they support each other in, in this sense. In the world that uh, is foreign to them because uh, the world they used to is gone. But you, a lot of your characters have experienced this unnatural solitude. Well, in the books that I've read, here for this. Well, I, I mean, it's easier to write about people who are lonely. <laughs> because then you have more empathy and you, you can explain why they are lonely and what is their attitude towards the world. And then the story becomes more complicated in a way. And... Uh, Psychologically more interesting, I think. I, uh, I, I probably I wouldn't be able to write a book about a happy couple. <laughs> it's be rather boring. Can we have the lady in the with the yellow? Oh, sorry, sorry. No. The, do you have any women writers in there, or how many do you have, and what genre do they write? Well, I think we have. Uh, well. Uh, you mentioned uh, uh, that I have a lot of strong women characters in my books uh, because actually Ukraine is a very interesting society. It's a society of secret matriarchat. So, I mean, the ladies are so clever, they allow men to think that they are important. <laughs> but the, the world in Ukraine is ruled by women. And, I mean, um, my grandmother... Uh, was a tough lady, much tougher than my tough uh, grandfather. Uh, my mother was also a doctor, and she was also tougher than my father, who was military pilot and then uh, civil aviation test pilot. So uh, we have more uh, 
ladies writers than men writers. Probably, if we talk about percentage, probably 60 or 70 percent of writers in Ukraine uh, are uh, uh, female writers. And what they write about, I mean, they, uh, n now they, they write uh, a lot about, uh, uh, well, political situation, but before they were writing uh, romantic novels, uh, historical novels, and uh, some kind of surreal prose, which is also quite typical for Ukraine. Uh, it's like post Gogol uh, literature uh, where the fantasies are not so romantic as in Gogol's books, but uh, sometimes quite surprising and shocking. Also, we have uh, several writers, uh, uh, female writers, who write uh, still about sex, but not about rock and roll. Um, uh, Andre, um, great, great to see you. I mean, we, we were in Kiev together just before the invasion um, when it wasn't entirely clear what happened. We thought it was going to happen. It, it, it did happen. I mean, now, four weeks on, uh, I'm, I'm just curious as to what, you, what your sort of settled view is as to why Putin invaded. I mean, we have a kind of image of someone who was already conspiratorial and paranoid and living in a parallel reality, you know, isolated in COVID, who, who, you know, has become an amateur historian who wrote a kind of crazy essay last year, 6,000 words long, which seems to be a kind of predicate for what happened. I mean, do you, do you have any insight in, into why he did this um, two decades into his rule? What's, what's, your, what's your thinking? Well, first of all, uh, I want to say that uh, he repeated many times in the last 20 years that his personal biggest drama was the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, it was clear that his dream was to recreate the Soviet Union or Russian superpower, which is impossible to do without you annexing Ukraine. Uh, and I think now when he got so old and he looks not very healthy, uh, and uh, I mean, he doesn't care about soldiers who are killed in Ukraine. He doesn't care about economy that is killed by sanctions. He wants to remain in the Russian history as somebody who recreated, uh, made not America but Russia great again, sort of recreated a new version of the Soviet Union. And that's uh, the legacy he wants to leave behind at any price. Uh, so, I mean, from my point of view, this is actually his driving uh, force, this driving idea. So, I mean, which means that uh, while he is alive, the war will go on, and uh, uh, and and the war can easily spill out uh, across the borders because I mean he is trying to force Lukashenko to start to open the second front in Volhynia on the border with Poland. He hates Poland already for many years, Putin. And so if the second front uh, is open, then uh, Poland will be definitely hit by missiles. And then it will be already a question to NATO, will NATO defend Poland or not? Because I mean, I know some, for example, Lithuanian politicians who are not sure that NATO will defend Lithuania if Russia attacks Lithuania. So in fact, actually, Putin managed to destroy the reputation of NATO. He managed to split up the European Union, and that's why we don't have one monolith voice of the European Union. We have uh, separate voices of different members of the European Union, and one German-speaking voice is very soft and nice, and Angela Merkel actually was treating Putin like a fluffy pet, uh, when actually already uh, he killed lots of people inside the country and outside the country. Italy, I mean, Berlusconi loved uh, Putin, and they had a lot of things in common, and Putin gave him as a present a wonderful bed, uh, double bed from Karelian Birch. So, I mean, if you see how many politicians were corrupted by Putin in Europe, you can understand why European Union doesn't have one united voice. 
We've got time for just one more question. You've been waiting very patiently. Thank you. If we could finish on a literary note, because that was so wonderful. Um, could I ask you which European writers you admire? And if I read you in Russian, who would you most sound like? You know, my favorite writer in the beginning was Andrei Platonov, uh, who is available in a wonderful English translation by Chan Robert Chandler. Uh, I loved uh, uh, Boris Pilnyak, less known writer. I love Kafka and Gogol, and I loved Bulgakov. Uh, I love uh, uh, Jacques uh, Perec, uh, French writer. Uh, and I was influenced very much by Daniel Charms, or Charms, he's pronounced in different ways, but it is an incredible uh, writer who was the father of the black humor literature and absurdist literature in, in the Soviet Union. And uh, uh, my favorite story about him, because I mean, he died in blockaded uh, Leningrad during blockade of hunger in psychiatric asylum. But uh, when the censorship was gone, or almost gone in Gorbachev's time, somebody published an encyclopedia of writers in Russia, and there there was a small article text about Daniel Harms, and this person who wrote this text uh, had a wonderful sense of humor because the text was just in Harms' style. And the last line was that in 1943, uh, Daniel Harms uh, went to pick up mushrooms and was never seen again. <laughs> went to the forest to pick up mushrooms, yeah. Brilliant. Before I invite you all to, uh, to, to, to thank uh, Andre for, for his time this evening, um, I uh, want to just do a shout out for Pramvera Smith, who uh, this event wouldn't have been possible without Pramvera. Um, <laughs> And that goes for a lot of the events that we've been hosting here at the Conduit recently relating to the war in Ukraine. Um, so thank you, Prem Vera. Um, but please do rush and buy copies of Andre's book. Um, and please join me one final time. Oh, sorry. And I, I want also to, to ask you uh, uh, to, to read books about Ukraine. Uh, not only fiction, but uh, first of all, non-fiction and history. And there are at least three wonderful books about history of Ukraine by Timothy Snyder and Appleboim uh, and Sergei Plohi, Canadian historian of Ukrainian origin. So uh, please just, if you have time, uh, read books about Ukraine and then you can read also books by Ukrainian authors and there are more translations now available than before. So thank you, Andre. And, and, and uh, before you go, please join us on the 21st of April to, we have Fiona Hill here, who's here, an amazing life story. She started out as a coal miner's daughter from Durham and she ended up, as I said, as a, a Russia advisor to presidents, a fascinating, inspiring woman. Um, and, and thank you for, again, Pranvera, thank you to the Conduit Club. And thank you most of all to Andre for you know spending this time with us. And please buy lots and lots and lots of copies. I cannot you know recommend these books highly enough. And uh, and off we go. Yay. Thank you very much.